Hello everyone, welcome to the first installment of Organic Chem is Easy. Any questions along the way, leave a comment on this video or email me at organicchemiseasy at gmail.com. This first video I'm calling it Meet the Gang because we are going to get to know some of the atoms we will be working with in organic chemistry. Before that, we are going to quickly review. What is an atom? An atom is first made up of a nucleus or a core in the center here. In the core we have two things, protons and neutrons. I have a plus sign for the protons and I have one neutron here. It's uh, denoted with an N. Don't worry about what's inside of those. A lot of people are still trying to figure that out anyway. What does a proton do? It's positive. If you have one proton, you have a charge of plus one. If you have two protons, like what I've got here, you have a charge of plus two. What do the neutrons do? Nothing. For now, we're just going to let them hang out. If we were interested in building some WMDs or something like that, then we'd talk about the neutron. But for now, we're just going to leave it out of the discussion here. But uh, so, that's, so that's the core. Outside, we have electrons. Electrons zip around in these little paths called orbitals. I'm going to draw these neat dotted lines right now, but in reality, electrons can go in pretty much a lot of crazy directions. Uh, don't worry about where they actually go. A lot of people are still trying to figure that out. What does an electron do? It's negative. If you have one electron, you have a charge of minus one. If you have two electrons, you have a charge of minus two. Unless you've already got some protons, like what we got going on here. If you want to find the overall total charge of an atom, that's protons and neutrons combined, you just have to pair up the protons and electrons. Anything left over, then you have a net charge. In our fake atom here, everybody's got a partner, one proton for one electron, so no overall charge. This is actually how all atoms look on the periodic table. This is how they all come stock. One proton for every one electron. Looking at the table here, the first number you notice is the number of protons. And for neutral, or atoms with no charge, the number of electrons also. Remember, one proton for every electron. So hydrogen is one, one proton. Helium is two, two protons, and so on. If we go over here to neon, neon is 10. And it's pretty much the same for, you can go all the way to uranium, or even like Einsteinium, it comes neutral charge in the periodic table. So one proton for every neutron. So what happens if we were to change the number of protons in an atom? Well, looking at the table, if you change the proton, you have to change just this number here, because that's the number of protons. So you do inevitably, inevitably change the atom altogether. We don't want to do that because, believe me, that's just about as hard as it sounds, and it could get us into a lot of trouble. Can we change the number of neutrons? Sure. That makes something called an isotope. Like I said, we don't want to do that right now either, because that's the stuff atomic bombs are made out of, and I don't want to get arrested. But what if we change the electrons? Ah, I think that sounds relatively harmless. We can do that. We can add electrons and take them away. But notice, it will upset this little equation here. In other words, we have to deal with a new overall charge. If we take away an electron, the protons win, and we have a positive charge. If we add an electron, the electrons win, and we have an overall negative charge. Remember, whatever's left over. These are charges. I've drawn pictures of them, and I've circled the plus and the minus because, well, organic chemists, they just like to do that. It's convention. I'm going to put atoms here now, so we can associate these charges with real atoms. How about sodium and chlorine? What I've got here is a sodium that has had one electron taken away, so it started off with one for one, and because it had one electron removed, the protons win. So you have sodium plus charge, and a chlorine that has a similar but opposite story, it has had one electron added to it. So now there's one more electron than it had to begin with, electrons win, net charge of one. Whether or not it's the same electron that sodium lost, we're not going to worry about that right now. That's called the redox reaction, and there's all sorts of conditions that we can study whether or not that's possible or easy for them. All we are worried about is the fact that whatever their story is, these two atoms have opposite charges now. They stick together, positive and negative. This is something you learn about in physics called electrostatic forces. But all that term really does is restate what we just said. Positive sticks to negative. And these two atoms together make something familiar. Sodium chloride. Chlorine changes her name to chloride, 
kind of like how a lady will change her name when she is married, from chlorine to chloride. No big deal. Still chlorine, just now with a charge and a buddy to stick to. This slob over here, sodium. Sodium chloride is table salt. And this is an ionic bond. So there you go. We've illustrated our first bond. You may ask, Alex, why don't you draw a line or something? We're going to get to that. The answer is no. Organic chemists have so little respect for this ionic electrostatic bond that they don't even draw a line to represent it. In fact, this bond is so weak, if we were to drop this marriage or this bond into some water or any kind of solvent, it would break apart immediately. So it's really just not a bond at all. Sadly, it's not built to last. It's a very shallow attraction. Sodium doesn't really care what chloride is made of or what other atoms it's composed of. He just kind of likes the simple fact that he feels a negative charge from her, and he sticks to her as long as the going doesn't get rough. Wow, I did not expect that to get so sad, but I guess that's the drama of electrostatic forces. But first, before we talk about a different type of bond, I'm going to introduce you to a subject that causes a lot, of, a lot more drama in the periodic table. All these atoms here look very happy, one little community, but in reality, they are not very content. There is something that is very coveted in the atomic community, and that is a full valence shell. What do I mean by valence shell? Remember, remember those dotted lines back here that I called orbitals, the ones that electrons traveled on? A valence shell simply refers to whatever dotted line is on the outside. And I kind of deceived you. In reality, a lot of electrons can fit on one dotted line. It's not one dotted line for every electron. In fact, for most of them, it's up to eight electrons. The valence shell is the shell that gets all the action. And these electrons out here they're kind of like the bumper on a car. They are the first to get dinged up when an atom hits into another. So back to the table. Now what do I necessarily mean by a full valence shell? Turns out atoms are very tidy. They like all the little spaces filled up. So when I said the valence shell can fit up to eight electrons, all the atoms pretty much want that valence shell filled perfectly with eight, at with eight electrons. A filled outer shell is its kind of like the Red Ryder BB gun. All these elements, all the way to the right, they got it. They're like the rich kids in the neighborhood who have eight electrons already because, you know, their parents were rich or whatever. So since they have eight electrons and they don't really need, feel the need to steal electrons or engage in anything to fill up their valence shell, they're called noble elements. They don't really react. They're stuck up. They already got everything they need. In reality, helium up here is only two electrons to the valence shell, but that's just because it can't fit eight, because it's a much smaller element. You can think of it as the mini Red Rider BB gun if you want. So all the other elements, this is kind of like the slum. They're out of luck. It's a mess. Some have only four electrons in the valence shell, some three, some six. Whatever their story is, they want a full valence shell, eight. So. Since they're a lot less fortunate, they do this scam, and this scam is called the covalent bond. It's a way for atoms to feel like they have a full valence shell. The poor kids get to, well, they get to feel like a millionaire as long as they make a small investment. As I show you what I mean, I'm going to introduce you to the first element of the organic chemistry neighborhood. So this is carbon. Carbon is like Jerry Seinfeld. Even though he may not be that eccentric alone, he's kind of the straw that stirs the drink in organic chemistry. He's the popular guy. In fact, when we say it's organic, all we are really saying is that it's made up of carbon. Unless you're talking about food or shampoo or anything like that. Trader Joe's. Uh, but carbon has only four electrons in its valence shell. Remember the red brighter BB gun? That's eight electrons, so he's pretty far away from getting that perfect eight. I'm going to represent his four electrons by drawing four dots around him. One, two, three, and four. There is a way to predict how many valence electrons an element has, and it is like this. You count from the left of the table while skipping this big gap here. One, two, three, four. If that doesn't make any sense to you, or you don't like the periodic table, you just stress out when you see it, don't sweat it. The beauty of organic chemistry is that there aren't that many electrons or atoms that you need to know. 